Then I got to play Dodge the Spinning Wings of Death with my cutting tools. Hello Internet, my name is Quentin and this is Blondie Hacks. Today we're finishing up the Toolmaker's Clamps. This is part two. If you missed part one, I'll put a card up there at the top for you to go watch that video first. Okay, let's go. If you're just joining us, in the previous video we made the jaws shown in yellow and blue and also that orange clip that retains the front knob. So now we're just going to make the knobs themselves. I'm going to make these out of 01 tool steel and uh, I had originally intended to harden them when I was done. In the end I decided not to because I put so much work into these parts that I was afraid of warping them as uh, heat treating tends to do. So I can still choose to do that later but uh, just being made from tool steel they are going to hold up very well. And here is the tool steel in question. This is 01 drill rod, which uh, the Brits would call silver steel, I believe. I'm cutting the stock a few inches over size, and you'll see why here in a moment. But I'll start with facing off the end, as is tradition. And I'll get my number two center drill in there and put a center in there for some tail support. Now I'm arranging the stick out such that I have room for the parting blade, and I have an extra quarter inch of length at the tail stock end and an extra couple inches at the other end. And again, you'll see why here in a moment, but I'm going to start by turning the entire piece down to the largest diameter. Now I'm not getting great chip action here and my rigidity is pretty poor. So let's see what we can do about those problems. This is actually a really good use case for the follow rest, which you don't see very often, but since we're doing long thin turning, this is a good time to use it. So I set this guy up and I get my feeler gauge in there and I put about a one thou gap between the fingers and the parts so that there's room for an oil film in there. And then I lock it down, get some oil in there, and we are off and running. And this is turning much, much better. The follow rest is doing its job. You can see we're getting good chip action there. And this all seemed to be going great. No problem. Really happy with this. And then I ran out of space. Luckily, I noticed this before it hit the chuck. But uh, yeah, there isn't room here to use the follow rest with the amount of material that I have. I did make one effort to see if I could pull the stock out far enough to fit the follow rest in between the end of my part and the chuck, but it just wasn't going to work out. So instead, I ditched the follow rest and just focused on doing lighter passes, which honestly worked fine. So we should be on our largest diameter now, and I'm just uh, checking with the micrometer in multiple places because I'm frankly expecting to get some sort of bulge in the middle here as the stock flexes away from the tool, but actually I didn't. Uh, we're within a half thou all the way down the length, so that's good news. The light cuts are doing what I hoped they would do. Next I'm going to get some Sharpie on there so I can mark the largest diameter change, which is where the base of the knob meets the threaded area. And that threaded area has to be turned down all the way down to the diameter for a number 12 thread. And I set up an indicator on the carriage there so I can end up with a nice shoulder at the end. If you want to know how I do this, you can see my turning to a shoulder video in the Lathe Skills series. Now as I turn this down, something I haven't mentioned yet is why I left a quarter inch of extra length at the tailstock end. And that's so that there's room for the center there and then when the part is done we can face that end off and not end up with a center in the end of our thumb screws. Now when turning tool steel, which turns hot because it's tough stuff, here's something you really got to watch for. Do you notice anything I miss here? Do you see it? Yeah, the part's spinning, but the tailstock live center is not. So what happens here is the tool steel gets hot, it expands, it pushes the tailstock back a little bit because the clamp can't resist the expansion of steel. And then as it cools and shrinks again, now the tailstock is unseated. And it's very easy to not notice this, but the effect of it will either be chatter or more commonly you'll just end up with a little bit of taper in the part because the tailstock wasn't firmly seated. Okay, this is our finishing pass now. The next feature we need is a relief area at the base of the thread. So I'm marking where one edge of that will go and I'm squaring up my tool post and I've got a little half round form tool in there that I ground for this purpose. And I'm just gonna feed that in really slowly and form a nice little semicircular thread relief. I wasn't sure how well this was gonna go because we're way out in the middle of, the, of a thin piece of stock here and this is tool steel and it's a form tool. That's all a recipe for unsuccess. But actually this worked very, very well. Slow speed, lots of oil, gentle feed, and that's a very fine looking thread relief.
The next feature is a 50 thou wide slot for holding that spring steel clip at the top of the jaws. And so for that, I made a special form tool. I roughed it out on the bench grinder and then I cleaned it up on the D-bit grinder, just freehanding that. And if I did my job right, this should be exactly 50 thou wide. And indeed it is. It's nice when that works out. And to position it on the part, I'm just lining it up with this shoulder and then counting down with the indicator to get it to where the drawing says it should be. A little sanity check with this scale there to make sure that we're where I think I am. And then in we go. I'll come in here with a chamfering tool and break those corners. So I've got a thin slot there, which conveniently I can do both those edges at once. And then while I'm here, I'm also going to deburr that shoulder that we turned earlier. I think that came out quite nice. So the last feature that I need to do is the knurling on the handle of the thumb screw. And for that, I'm going to bring in my knurler, and this is my preferred type of knurler, the scissor type, which clamps from above and below rather than the push style where you're pushing straight in on the work. The latter is quite hard on the spindle bearings in your lathe. And as you can see, this was recently used for brass, and I should have cleaned out the brass before doing this, but yeah, it'll all come out in the wash. Now, I'm not particularly good at knurling, and I'm not going to attempt to tell you how to do it because, well, I'm not very good at it. The quality of the knurls on the four knobs varied quite a bit, but uh, here's the uh, the best of the four. Anyway, I'll uh, pull a YouTube here and not show you the other three, which don't look nearly this nice. So this nearly completes the front knob for one of the two clamps. And so I turned the other knob the same way for the second clamp, and then the rear knobs I brought to the same point, but the rear knobs need an extra couple of features. So I'm going to do that next. The rear knob needs a groove for an E-clip instead of the spring clip that's in the knurled area. So I've got an E-clip grooving tool that I've made previously. It's 30 thou wide and I just line that up with the indicator relative to the shoulder once again. It's worth noting that I'm using the shoulder of the knob as my datum for locating all of the features on these thumb screws. And I'm not using the end of the part like you might normally do. And that's because, as I said earlier, I have roughly a quarter inch of extra material at the end of the part so that I can face off where the center was drilled. But that's not super precise down there. So by using this shoulder, I know that the thumb screws will come out properly dimensioned within the extra stock that I have at each end. Let's see if my E-clip fits now on that groove. And ooh, it does indeed. A well-fitting E-clip is extremely satisfying. And then I'll come in here with my little needle file and deburr the very tiny edges of that tiny slot. So then I made the second rear thumb screw to this same point. And now we have all four thumb screws ready for the next operation, which is the threads. And I'm going to step outside the box here a little bit on Blondie Hacks, and I'm going to single point thread them. It's not something you see me do a lot, and that's for this reason here, because I have to do the change gears every time. But since I have four of them to do, I thought, eh, it'll be fine. It's worth doing the setup here for single pointing these guys. So I check the chart on the front of the machine here, and it tells me how to arrange the gears to get 28 threads per inch, and which gear knob position to use. And then I proceed to spend a frustrating 20 minutes digging through boxes of gears and deburring parts as needed and swapping things out. One thing to watch for with this particular lathe is these washers that go behind a stack of change gears are different thicknesses. And that's so that you can get slightly different alignments depending on whether the front gear is above or below the gear next to it on the banjo. That took me a really long time to figure out. The first couple times I did these change gears, I couldn't get them to fit and it took me forever to figure out why. So. Yeah, check for little details like that on your change gear arrangement. And then a little oil in those hubs and some grease on the gears, and we are ready to make threads. I'm going to put some die cam on the area to be threaded there, just because it makes it easier to see what I'm doing on the first few passes. And then I'll use the fishtail gauge to get the threading tool squared up. And you'll notice that my threading tool is upside down, and that's because I'm going to be threading away from the chuck with the lathe running in reverse. This is my preferred method of doing it. Okay, I'm ready to engage the half nut for my scratch pass, and oh, frick. Mm. 
I actually forgot to reverse the lathe and so it fed the wrong direction and put a nice little scratch pass on my shoulder area there. Luckily it's not very deep, I can clean that up later. But I reversed it, did my actual scratch pass, and I check it with the thread pitch gauge and we are on 28 threads per inch, which means I did all of that change gear madness the correct way, and away we go on our first actual pass. Now because this is tool steel and it's a thin part with not a lot of support in the middle, I'm doing very, very light passes, even light by threading standards. Like I did a 5 thou first pass, and then a couple of 3 thou passes, and then every pass after that was 1 thou or less. And as I got close to the end, I did multiple spring passes on each normal pass. So I would do two or even three spring passes. And that really helps normalize the material removal all the way down the length, especially in the middle where the stock might tend to be pushing away from the tool. And it helps eliminate taper and helps make sure that you're really on the dimension that you think you are on. So after a few passes, we should be close. So I'm gonna do a test fit. And here's the jaw that's gonna be threading on. And well, here's something I didn't think of. I left that extra quarter inch at the end, but I didn't thread it all the way to the end. The whole point of that was to give me room for the center and a run out area for the thread. So that area doesn't fit through the threaded hole, of course. So I had to reduce the diameter of it so it would clear. And uh, I used a file for that because that has very low tool pressure and I didn't have much to remove. And now I can do a test fit. And it's very, very close. I can tell that it wants to start. It's at that moment where it just feels like it might be dirty or it's tight, but it just won't quite start. So I did another one thou pass and then two more spring passes. And that was all it took to get it on dimension. Now it threads on there beautifully. There's nothing quite like the fit of a single pointed thread. They're so smooth and nice. I did the other three knobs the same way, but uh, on those I did actually reduce the diameter of the end there with a grooving tool before doing the threading. Over to the mill now, I kind of called an audible here. I decided I should uh, take advantage of the extra stock that's on each part at this point and use it to fixture in a collet block so I can drill a hole through each knob for a Tommy bar. I had uh, not originally had that in my drawing, but I uh, decided, you know, anything that clamps has the potential to get stuck. So I'm gonna regret it someday if I don't put a Tommy bar hole in there. So I centered it up with an edge finder and then I measured in from the end of the shoulder. Again, that's my datum with the edge finder to place the center drill. Now spotting a hole on a knurl is a little tricky because the knurl wants to make the, the drill jump around. So I just did it very, very carefully. It would have been also a good idea maybe to just mill a flat spot with an end mill first, but this worked fine, honestly. And in the future, I would probably have drilled these holes first before the knurling, but uh, this worked out just fine. So a little machinist jack in there for some support against the drilling forces and just drill that through. That's looking good. We'll need to deburr that later, but for now, let's go back to the lathe and I'm gonna set up to part this knob off. So again, I'm using that shoulder as my reference and I'm parting off at the length specified in the drawing for each of the knobs. Once again, little sanity check with the scale here. Looks good, so away we part. After going in part way, I come back out and I go back in with the chamfering tool to put a nice generous chamfer on the end of that knurl. And uh, I also chamfered the other end of the knurl at this point because I had actually missed a couple of them. You always want to chamfer both sides of a knurled area because knurling pushes material outwards and it makes a really nasty edge. And Yahtzee. And we'll file that little nubbin off later. Sidebar. Every time I show a parting nubbin, somebody inevitably comments, hey, you know you can bevel the front of a parting blade so that that doesn't happen. Yes, I'm aware of that trick, but here's the thing. If it's a thin parting blade, that causes the blade to deflect. And I use pretty much the thinnest parting blade you can buy on this lathe because it's a small hobby lathe. The downside is the front edge of it has to be perfectly square to prevent deflection. The upside is I can do stunts like parting off tool steel on a lathe that costs less than the spindle bearings in a Monarch. The last thing we need to do is face the end off where the extra stock is for the center south of the threads. So I'm grabbing a chunk of aluminum from the junk bin here and I'm gonna make a little device to help do that. 
So here's making this part all the way from start to finish, not something I often show. There's no edits here, and this is of course normal speed. Now while I'm making this, see if you can figure out what it is. Did you guess? That's right, it's a threaded split block. So I can thread the part in here, and I'll be able to compress that with the four jaw chuck, and we can hold it on the threaded area without damaging those threads and face off the end. At least, that was the idea. Stay tuned to see how this goes. So that's dialed in, clamped down nice and tight. Here goes, uh oh, did you see that? Here, I'll go back and forth quickly so you can see what's happening. You see that? Yeah, <laughs> even though it's clamped down very tight, it's still threading itself in under the cutting forces, so this wasn't going to work. If I had split this block all the way across, this might have worked out, but there's an easier way. What I really needed was a jam nut, and I don't have a box full of 1228 nuts lying around. One of the disadvantages to using a strange thread is, well, you don't have strange hardware with which to clamp. I did manage to get lucky and find a single wing nut in the back of my junk bin that happened to have a 1228 thread in it. Imagine the luck. So I used it as a jam nut, and uh, then I got to play dodge the spinning wings of death with my cutting tools. But I managed to face and chamfer the ends of those thumb screws. This block was definitely not a complete waste of time. It was still a nice easy way to swap from one part to the next and hold them in the fore jaw without risk of damaging the threads. And then I went over to the vise, filed off the nubbins, and deburred those tommy bar holes. I'm quite pleased with how that came out. Very nice. Let's do some test fitting now. So here's the E-clip that goes on the rear bolt of each of the clamps, and the E-clip won't quite go in. Like, it's starting, but it's jamming up in there. So the recess area there is not quite clear of the E-clip slot. So I went back to the mill and just took a few more thousands off of there, and now the clip fits in there perfectly, and that is delightful. Now for the mounting bolts for the spring clips, I don't have any cap screws the right length, so I took some longer ones, and I put Sharpie on there, thread them in, mark the length, and then transfer that length, and cut the screws down to size with a diamond blade because they are hardened. Then the final step, of course, is to spend 20 minutes figuring out where that landed in the shop. Now we can do a test fit with the knob and the clip and see if this all works. Certainly it looks very pretty. And that works beautifully, just like it should. Now let's thread the two halves together and see how it works. And as you might imagine, you have to thread the two halves together sort of in parallel or else it'll get crooked and jam up. This is perhaps the weakness of this design versus the other design that I showed in the previous video. But this design has twice the clamping force, which I like. And it clamps all the way down to zero, and so now you can see how the recesses and things all work together there to allow that. So that is very lovely indeed. We can clamp a piece of paper with this thing if we need to. Now on to finish. I'm going to clean everything up with acetone, get rid of any traces of oil or grease on there. And I'm using Jack's Cold Blue for this, which works well when the parts can be dunked. So the degreased parts are dunked, and they're just left in there for a few seconds. Pull them out, rinse them off in some water to stop the reaction, dry them off. And then a light buffing with a paper towel to get the excess blackening off of there. And then a little bit of oiling will seal them up nice and good for life. Looking good. Okay, final assembly time. So the knobs go back in, and gratuitous eclipse shot, because those are very satisfying. That's the stuff. And the knobs themselves, I'm just going to oil. I'm going to leave them bright finish. And the clips as well are just getting oil on them. These clamps, I think, are going to get a lot of use, but I could also uh, put some Bow Shield or some other rust inhibitor on the knobs if desired. And I may still come back and heat treat those. We'll see. And they go back together just like they did before, and we are done. This is a pair of Toolmaker's clamps. I had a ton of fun making these. These are going to be super useful around the shop. I hope you enjoyed watching me make them. Once again, if you'd like drawings and 3D models of these clamps and the other type that I also drew up, you can find those on my Patreon. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.